Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, uh, otherwise known as the EESI. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's briefing. I mean, how many times do you get to come to an exciting briefing like this on a Friday afternoon? Come on, folks, right? So anyway, we're very, very glad that you are here, and we are very glad to be sponsoring this briefing with the Center for Climate and Security. And I also want to thank very much the Jackson Foundation as well as the David Rockefeller Foundation. Without their support, we would not be able to do so much of this important work on climate and security uh, that is so important to our country, uh, to our uh, security forces here and also around the world. And so I want to say thank you very, very much uh, to, to those foundations for making this possible and all of the work that we are trying to do to help bring these issues to policymakers so that everyone can understand more about the impacts that we are seeing and how it is very much related to security and to uh, both, both in terms of our physical uh, facilities as well as to um, the security of, of um, societies around the world. So as many of you probably know, uh, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute is an organization that was started as an independent nonprofit back in 1984 by a bipartisan congressional caucus. We were charged uh, by those bipartisan members with providing greater resources to policymakers on energy and environmental issues that were coming before the Congress or issues that probably should be coming before the Congress to find ways to look at policy options to provide uh, more educational uh, opportunities so that there could be a better informed policy debate at all times understanding that a healthy environment and a healthy economy go hand in hand. So I would encourage any of you who are not familiar with the ESI, please go to our website, learn more, find out how you can participate in terms of uh, getting on our distribution lists for fact sheets for our briefings, et cetera, because this is all about helping all of us become better informed so that we can all make better decisions, come up with more creative and common sense innovative solutions. So to start off our briefing today, and we have a terrific panel that is dealing with this whole issue of military bases and the communities that support them and how we make these military bases and those communities more resilient. We have a panel that is very engaged in dealing with this on very much a day-to-day -day basis that has uh, been looking at this issue for a number of years, has been doing a lot of thinking, talking, um, advising uh, at all levels within the military and with the communities that's, that support these facilities. But to kick off our panel this afternoon, I want to call on Susan Wickwire, who has been a member of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation Board for 10 years and is currently uh, vice president of the foundation. And Susan um, now lives in Seattle, but she had been here in Washington for many years where she has worked on climate change, clean energy, and sustainability, uh, both at EPA, where she uh, was uh, very much involved in terms of directing national climate programs and managed a number of international climate change projects and also participated on U.S. delegations to the international climate change discussions. And she also uh, served at the State Department as well. Uh, so, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are so pleased to be able to hold this event with EESI and the Center uh, for Climate and Security, who is another one of our uh, grantees, and we really appreciate having their voice on this panel as well. The kinds of significant risks that we're going to hear about today are exactly why Senator Henry M. Jackson uh, cared so deeply about these issues and why the foundation that was established after his passing in the early 1980s 
wants to shine a spotlight on such a, an important issue and on the national security implications of climate change. For over 30 years, the Jackson Foundation has been advancing the work of the Senator. Protecting the environment was one of his top priorities. He also emphasized a, a strong defense and supporting the military. So this issue kind of brings together a lot of the interests of the Senator and the Foundation as we, we continue his, his work. When he was uh, here on Capitol Hill many decades ago, uh, he was always looking for informed policy uh, opportunities. He uh, consulted academics, scientists, wanting to be sure that he had all the right information. He also prioritized working across the aisle in a bipartisan fashion. So that's something else that we're interested in promoting. Currently, uh, climate change is one of our highest priorities as we do consider it a national security threat. For over 15 years, both Democratic and Republican administrations have studied and concluded that climate change multiplies existing security threats. The critical national security implications of climate change, including the challenges to our military installations and their surrounding communities, must be addressed. We have been closely monitoring recent reports that the NSC is looking to create a panel that will call into question some of the climate change science on impacts and on um, adaptation. We are very concerned about this development at the foundation, which only promises to politicize U.S. military agreed uh, assessment of the urgent climate change risks, and it also threatens to undermine the scientific process, which we believe in. We are deep, deeply dismayed at the foundation that the NSC would choose to this path to go after the findings of the administration, um, its own intelligence, defense, and scientific agencies, including the findings of the National Climate Assessment that came out just a few months ago. Um, so we believe that a unified response by the national security community, amplified like events that we're supporting here today, will underscore the near universal consensus that climate change poses uh, as a clear and present national security threat. And so this is just a very timely opportunity for us to be supporting this important discussion to look at all aspects of the issue, including you know, what happens here um, on the home front and how climate change is having an impact um, on our national security system. So thank you so much for, for letting us be a part of this. So I now would like to turn to Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, who is the Special Assistant to the Governor for Coastal Adaptation and Protection for the State of Virginia. I think this was one of the smartest appointments that the Governor could have made, because in so doing, he picked somebody who has been so very much on the ground in terms of working with the communities in the whole Hampton Roads area knows that area so well and has been such an important leader, planner, visionary in terms of bringing messages from there, has been a star of documentaries looking at this whole area. Uh, prior to joining the uh, governor's administration in Virginia, uh, Admiral Phillips has been working to address sea level rise and climate impact on national security at the regional, national, and international levels. She is a voice that many of us have been listening to, um, asking questions of, really seeking out uh, because of her uh, thoughtful and uh, always questioning, always uh, asking uh, for what kinds of steps need to be taken really closely, observing the situation and always reaching out to bring more and more people together. Uh, Admiral Phillips retired in 2014 after serving nearly 31 years on active duty in the U.S. Navy, and I have heard her refer to herself as a boat driver. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you today and to be here again with EESI and, and uh, the Center for Climate and Security, and I, I think I should just update Carol's comments and say that there are actually two people here today who have been on the ground on Hampton Roads working on things, and you will hear from Ben McFarlane. After following me, I'm going to stick at the state of Virginia level today, and Ben will tell you uh, what he has been working on for a number of years to make progress in Hampton Roads. 
and I'm here to say that Hampton Roads is making progress uh, and that they take this issue very seriously. So first, uh, thank you again, Carol, for that kind introduction. And finally, thank you to the Henry M. Jackson Foundation and the David Rockefeller Fund for their support of this event today. I'm honored to be here and to be part of such a distinguished panel. As Carol mentioned, I am a surface warfare officer. I retired after 31 years driving ships for the Navy. I was trained, uh, like my peers, to view a mission in the context of strategic, operational, and tactical terms, clear-eyed, pragmatic focus, and to prepare for and execute based on engineering and scientific fact. That carries through throughout the Department of Defense. My experience with the impacts of climate and coastal adaptation on national security and on our federal properties and surrounding communities really stems from my work, the opportunity I had to be a chair of a working group as a part of uh, the intergovernmental uh, pilot project that was conducted in Hampton Roads from 2014 to 2016. And now as the special assistant to the governor for, for, of the state of Virginia for coastal adaptation and protection. I'm here to talk today about the challenges we face in the state of Virginia in making our military bases and their surrounding communities more resilient. Virginia is honored to be the home of some of the most exceptional defense infrastructure that our nation brings to bear. Infrastructure, and I will say this more than once, hoping you'll remember that is not easily replicable in other locations. We are arguably the state with the largest and most concentrated federal and Department of Defense presence. According to the Office of Economic Adjustment and Report, defense spending by state in 2017, which was just released, Virginia derives 8.9% of our total state gross domestic product from the defense spending in the state, the highest of any state in the union. We also have the highest percentage of GDP of any state in the union. We also have the highest percentage of defense personnel spending and we are second only to California in total defense spending and total defense contract spending. So we care about the Department of Defense in the state of Virginia. We care about all our federal partners, but DOD is the largest. Coastal Virginia is in the grip of a slow moving and relentless existential threat from rising waters and recurrent flooding caused by rain, wind, tides, and storms in any combination. We're experiencing sea level rise change at an accelerated rate compared to many locations. In fact, we are the highest rate of change on the east coast of the United States because not only are we dealing with rising water, but the land is subsiding. This creates a serious and growing menace to our military, federal facility, and community readiness, resilience, and therefore to our nation's ability to prepare for and execute our national defense strategy. The challenge is particularly acute at coastal military installations, which are on the front lines. I've said this before in this venue and I'll say it again, we are a crucible for the entire range of challenges, largely stemming from the fact that we're dealing with water in places we don't want, need, or expect it on an ever more routine basis. You'll hear more de details about Hampton Roads in particular when my colleague Ben McFarland speaks here in a few minutes, but let me tell you a few things about what the state is doing about our military presence and our surrounding community, community infrastructure. Virginia boasts over 10,000 miles of tidally influenced coastline. In our eight coastal planning district regions, we have vast and matchless combinations of urban, suburban, and industrial infrastructure, including, in addition to the federal infrastructure, the Port of Virginia, the fifth largest U.S. port complex by container volume in the nation, and one of only 17 maritime administrator designated critical infrastructure ports. We also have the beauty of natural unspoiled coastlines, barrier island systems, and the support of traditional watermen's communities, longtime aquaculture and agriculture development, as well as water and beachfront tourism. We have national assets that are one of a kind facilities, as I've mentioned, with irreplaceable individual capabilities. And they are where they are because of the unique relationship they have with the geography and topography of our state. In addition to our tremendous federal presence in Northern Virginia and the Hampton Roads region, I'll talk about some of these facilities. They include Naval Station Norfolk, arguably our largest naval facility, our nation's only aircraft carrier construction and refueling facility, and one of only two submarine construction facilities in the country, Newport News Shipbuilding, one of four Navy-owned nuclear repair shipyards, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, which is actually in Portsmouth, Virginia, and on the eastern shore, NASA Wallops Flight Facility, 
which includes the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, U.S. Navy Surface Combat Systems Center, and the Navy's Missile Test Range. All very unique facilities, all of which are not easily moved. We know well in Virginia that climate change is complicating our federal, state, and local communities' ability to thrive and to maintain mission readiness and resilience. In fact, the Department of Defense actually has a long history in the state of collaborative and preparative work with the local communities to get ready for this threat. One great example for those who may not have looked at this because it's four years old, almost five now, but it's excellent, is the Risk Quantification for Sustaining Coastal Military Assets Study. The common vernacular is RC-1701 that the Army Corps led, Dr. Kelly Burks Copes, and completed in 2014. I want to read you a quote from that study. Sea level rise, it found, is a significant and pervasive threat multiplier to mission sustainability. It significantly increases loadings on built infrastructure and dramatically increases risk to system capabilities and service provisioning and logistics. Further, the work identified critical impacts to systems that were particularly vulnerable and likely to be incapacitated once sea levels rose above one meter. The results of the study showed the probability of damage to infrastructure and losses in mission performance increased dramatically, however, if we even got to half a meter of sea level rise. This indicated a tipping point or a threshold that should be considered when undertaking future planning or operational activities on the specific installation where they focus their work. That installation was Naval Station Norfolk. And the Virginia Institute of Marine Science assesses we could have that additional half meter of sea level rise on, on or about 2050, 30 years from now, well inside the infrastructure planning timeline of any major critical infrastructure. So how will we prepare for this encroachment by natural factors? And how will we look beyond the immediate local defense community and defense facility infrastructure to take on this system-wide threat to our collective resilience? In January 2018, the National Defense Authorization Act uh, in, directed, or a National Defense Authorization Act directed that DOD identify, DOD identify a series of, not in January 2018, in 2018 the NDAA directed that DOD identify its top 10 most critical and vulnerable facilities by service that were impacted by climate. This January 2019, that report was released. It identified 79 critical military installations. Nine are in Virginia, eight reported recurrent flooding as an impactor, and four, all in Hampton Roads, were specifically addressed as vulnerable to sea level rise and inundation. That includes Joint Base Langley Eustis, Navy Region Mid-Atlantic facilities, including Naval Station Norfolk again, NAS Oceana, and Naval Support Activity Hampton Roads. This validates what we already know is happening. The challenge is that adapting to climate change requires future projected look from a whole of government and community perspective so that we can work with the defense community to identify threats, evaluate the risk, and plan to projected future circumstances so that we can implement collaborative mitigation and adaptation actions for the entire deployment system, so the full logistics chain, not just the end where things, the ship leaves the pier, but everything it takes to get that material to that ship at that pier. That may be beyond our local defense communities. It may be elsewhere in the, in the system of systems. In Hampton Roads, an intergovernmental pilot project, as I talked about in 2016, talked again about key requirements for this whole of government approach, and I want to tell you what they are very briefly. The first were setting standards. The state has started to do that as a part of Executive Order 24, and the Hampton Roads region has started to do that. The second is that you need the support of a consortium of universities so that you have the best possible science and engineering at available at data available at your fingertips. The third key criteria was that you need open access and distribution of data so that you actually understand what's happening to your region and you can see what your trends are. The fourth is that we have to understand and identify dependencies and critical, and critical dependency, dependencies and interdependencies of critical infrastructure systems. And the fifth is we have to work towards create, creative and collaborative funding outcomes and strategies combining efforts at the federal, state, and local level. As discussed, Virginia thinks that bold action is necessary on this front, and in November of 18, Governor Northam signed out, as I mentioned, Executive Order 24, increasing Virginia's resilience to sea level rise and natural hazards. This will produce, among other things, setting standards for the state's state-owned built infrastructure and creating a coastal resilience master plan, which will look across and beyond jurisdictional boundaries. 
But we can't do it alone, and we cannot make our federal facilities islands. The full range of community assets, from utilities to housing to health care, and across hydrological, ecological, and sociological systems is located off base. As defense communities were inextricably linked to our federal partners, and these enormous concerns require creative joint solutions. A little bit about existing programs. The Army Corps' Coastal Storm Risk Management Studies, sometimes referred to as 3 by 3 by 3 studies, and continuing authorities programs, along with FEMA's pre-disaster hazard mitigation programs, offer opportunities to take advantage of federal funding support with non-federal match to reduce impacts of extreme weather and ongoing climate-related impact. But they're limited in size, number, and scope. They do not include federal property in the study efforts, and they are not able to keep pace with the scale of the threat that lies before us, because it's not just Hampton Roads. It's Charleston. It's Mayport. It's Kings Bay, it's San Francisco, it's Alaska, it's Washington, D.C., <laughs> says the Greater Washington Council of Governments. We are all going to be impacted by this at the same time. We don't have the luxury of picking and choosing first we're going to do this, then we're going to do that in many circumstances. Programs like the Office of Economic Adjustment, Joint Land Use Studies, which you'll hear more about from my, again, Ben McFarland, and their compatible use focus do give communities and DOD another shared understanding of regional impacts and opportunity to then prioritize key mitigation projects. While funded by DOD, however, this is executed by the community, so it doesn't necessarily give as much help to the Department of Defense facilities. Nevertheless, we need more of this work, and to ensure the continued vitality of our federal facilities and their shared dependencies, DOD, as I've mentioned, needs a detailed assessment of the threat to its facilities. Perhaps we start with those mentioned in the 2018 NDAA report. And then that can then be combined with these expanded tools we saw in the 2019 NDAA, which will give us more options and more opportunities. Some of those I'll mention briefly included expanding authorities for the Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program, REPI, Defense Access Roads Program, and the newly created but not yet implemented Defense Community Infrastructure Program. These would all give us another range of choices, but the challenges are always in the bottom line. REPI is funded by general fund operating funds and maintenance dollars, which the services can and have contributed to in the past. Defense Access Roads competes for critical MILCON funding, so it's up against other military construction needs. And the Defense Community Infrastructure Project had no money appropriated against it at all, pending decisions about how and by whom the program would be administered. Further, FEMA's Disaster Recovery Reform Act in 2018, October, also offers expanded opportunities for national public infrastructure pre-disaster mitigation, and the specific details of that program remain pending. So to take advantage of the full ability to implement across all of these tools, DOD needs a holistic planning process. In November of 2018, by chance, the Center for Climate and Security issued a briefer related to the 2018 NDAA report, which recommended the creation of a military installation resilience plan that would look across the full range of biological, hydrological, environmental, and sociological system impacts. Look at those dependencies and, depend and interdependencies across the whole system of systems that impact federal facilities, the surrounding communities, and then farther afield, full watershed reviews, which would be of interest in the Hampton Roads region access to air points of departure and sea points of departure, thinking of Wilmington, North Carolina, just as one example. If implemented, this would be of great value to the federal facilities and the defense communities. The National Building Council has been quoted many times, and I'll do it here too, that a dollar spent in pre-disaster mitigation saves $6 in post-disaster restoration costs. Our money would be well invested and well spent. So in closing, I would like to reiterate three points. First, we're at risk from an existential threat. Virginia understands we must do our part to prepare our communities in concert with our federal and defense partners. But it has to be a whole of government, community, and society approach, and it has to be a forward-looking, projected effort. Second, it's absolutely essential that we are, again, looking to the future, not history, to determine what we're going to do look outside the fence line, determine threats, mitigation needs, and then partner with our federal, state, and local agencies to find solutions. We know the future will be different from the past, and risk assessment, planning, and design implementation based on historical data is just wasting time, and it's limiting our options for the future. This will result in higher costs over time as the solutions 
options that we have window and the window of time to execute them begins to narrow. We'll be chasing our tail. We don't have time for that. Finally, we must take action on a coordinated legislative and appropriated support for pre-disaster readiness for our most threatened defense communities. We should create legislation necessary to create this military installation and resilience planning process. So federal organizations have a clear direction, authority, capacity, and capability to act in a way that is collaborative and consistent with the urgent situations that defense communities, particularly coastal defense communities in Virginia at least, now face. As Virginia acts to make our coast more resilient to this form of encroachment, we look forward to working with our defense communities and our federal and state and Department of Defense partners to continue to develop and streamline processes for actionable solutions with a clear path to execution to address our climate changed future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral Phillips. Um, sobering indeed. Uh, as, as Admiral Phillips indicated, uh, we have uh, an important colleague of hers who has been working again on the ground since 2008 in the Hampton Roads area. And that is Ben McFarland, who is a senior regional planner for the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. Since 2008, Ben has been involved um, on several projects, several major projects, including a plan for the Northwest River watershed in Chesapeake, Virginia, and the Hampton Roads Regional Green Infrastructure Plan. He, as part of his work, conducts regular research and analysis related to water quality issues, a terribly important issue in that area, comprehensive and general land use planning, and climate change, all of which are integrally intertwined. One of the things in looking at these important issues is how critical the communities are that surround our military facilities that support them. If people who work or people who are providing supplies to those facilities, anybody engaged, if they cannot get to that military base, even if it is somehow protected, then we have lost the ability to achieve mission readiness and to uh, protect our defense capability. So the communities that are involved are extraordinarily important and have to be part of all of the planning because their lives, um, everything in terms of their economy is impacted by the situation that you just heard Admiral Phillips describe. So it, um, so I must say it is with great admiration that I introduce Ben, who is having to deal with this, work with all of these communities. And I think that there are about 17 communities that are involved in all of this. That is a lot of coordination, a lot of pulling people together, trying to get everybody on the same page, to understand things, to work for solutions. It is an enormous job, and we should be glad that Ben is there doing it. It's a lot of meetings, <laughs> I'll tell you that. I uh, I good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here today. I want to thank ESI and the uh, Center for Climate and Security and the event sponsors for uh, inviting me here to be on this panel. Um, so I'm the only one with slides. I'm a planner, urban planner, and a bureaucrat, so I kind of need to have slides to do these kind of talks. Um, but I have tried to avoid having too much text, so a lot of pictures, little text, and hopefully we'll all be able to get through together. I want to talk a little bit today about, um, about our region of Hampton Roads, about what our agency, the HRPDC, does, and then some of the lessons that we've learned in talking with and working with the military and the Navy in particular um, about some of the challenges that we have in working with them, uh, trying to collaborate with them uh, between cities uh, in military installations, and also some of the opportunities that we've identified uh, for how we might move forward um, collaboratively uh, to improve the resilience not only of our individual communities and the installations, but also the region of Hampton Roads as a whole. So for those of you who aren't um, familiar with, with Hampton Roads, so we're on the southeastern corner of Virginia. We do have 17 
uh, member jurisdictions in our commission, um, 10 independent cities, six counties, one incorporated town, about 1.7 million people, not quite as big as Northern Virginia, uh, but we are the second largest region um, in the Commonwealth. A um, lot of work that's going on um, for our commission. We're actually a state-enabled but locally created regional planning agency. Um, the, our sister agency up here in North, or in this area would be the Northern Virginia Regional Commission if you've done any work with them. Uh, we, um, as across the state, there are about 20, 21 of, of our agencies and our role is to serve um, two things. One, our, our commission, which is comprised of elected officials and appointed officials, um, they come together once a month roughly uh, to discuss issues of greater than local importance. So that's a forum for them to get together, for those high elected officials uh, to come together and talk about uh, the issues that are important to the region. But below that level, we have quite a bit of coordination that goes on at the staff level between all the different cities, um, regional entities, utility providers, uh, stormwater managers at very different levels, various levels of governance uh, to get together on a regular basis and, and build a network of practice across uh, different, um, different uh, departments, different needs, different topics so that when there is a need for regional coordination for our localities to act together uh, that that network is there in place to help facilitate that and move it forward. Um, so in, in some we, you know, we act as a liaison between uh, our localities and state agencies and federal agencies. We provide a lot of services in terms of data and research and analysis to our localities. We do coordinate quite a bit. Uh, I think we, we just have, we're going to have three or four of our monthly standing meetings next week coming up. So, so we do have a lot of meetings, um, but we don't, uh, we don't pass laws, we don't mandate anything. So everything we do is by the grace of the localities that have come together to create us. Um, well, I will say though, on this topic of resiliency though, um, that it has been a key focus area for our commission uh, for over 10 years now. Um, there's been wide recognition uh, for a considerable amount of time in Hampton Roads that sea level rise, regardless of the cause, is something that our region is concerned about and needs to start doing something about. So we haven't had the luxury of waiting for the state or for the federal government to, to come to our, to our aid and to our rescue on this. So we've been working on this independently for quite some time. So Ann mentioned some of the military installations that are located in coastal Virginia. I'm not going to go through that list here, but I, what I will say is that Hampton Roads, we are both uh, blessed and, um, and, and fortunate to have the, one of the greatest concentrations of military assets, um, not only in the country, but probably in the world. Um, one of the d challenges that we have in working with the military um, in Hampton Roads is that many of these installations are actually located uh, adjacent to and right in the middle of established urban communities, which creates uh, quite a bit of complication and also uh, conflict, potential conflict between uh, the needs of the military and the needs and the wants of the community that hosts those installations. So um, some of those challenges that, that we've identified over the years in working with um, these different military installations, we have folks from the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, the Army. Um, I don't think we have a separate Marine Corps installation, but we have an expeditionary base, so cl close enough, um, is that uh, we sort of kind of gone through and try to summarize some of these um, these challenges that we faced. In some, so one I want to say uh, from an understanding perspective is that our installations, they don't really necessarily understand uh, the governance mechanisms behind uh, that guide and, and dictate what local governments can do both politically and practically and legally. Um, and also on the flip side, those communities don't always understand uh, what those installations, what their missions actually are and how those installation missions might change over time. From a data perspective, what we found is that uh, it's, Rarely, actually quite rare sometimes that localities and, and installations actually share data on uh, what kind of projects they have on the ground, what infrastructure they have. And for a place like Hampton Roads, which is very urban, where you have uh, things moving from one side of the fence to the other, when you don't share that information and that data, it becomes quite challenging to do effective long-term planning. Uh, from a priorities perspective, um, we think that we've, what we've noticed is that our, our community's installations, they, they happen to value different things. And, I, you know, sometimes those things are actually mutually exclusive and it really requires uh, folks to get together and talk about and see if they can identify uh, solutions that work for everyone and if they can't uh, to devise some way to, um, to resolve those conflicts. And then from a funding perspective, what we found is that in general, and I think this comes as no surprise to anyone in the room, there's not enough money going around to actually do the things that need to be done and on top of that, even if there is enough money in the aggregate, sometimes it's very difficult to actually coordinate a line different funding streams to achieve overall beneficial in, um, outcomes. So we think about uh, some of the friction points that are there between that, it would, that kind of keep localities from working effectively with, with installations. 
Um, I w one point I do want to say is that, um, you know, I think it's obvious that local governments, they're not working for the military. That's their job is to, to work for and to represent the residents and the citizens of those communities. Um, what makes that even more difficult, though, sometimes is that um, even if they would like to help the military out, the military doesn't always do a very good job of actually articulating what it is they would like for a local government to do, and there are certain restrictions on what they're allowed to do in terms of uh, ethics requirements and whatnot. Uh, but um, the conversations don't always take place that actually show um, or indicate to a community what would be beneficial for the military installations are there. So I do have a few examples of some of these conflicts and these challenges that have popped up over the last several years. One of these is um, a, um, an area, so this is actually from Joint Expeditionary Base Little Creek in the city of Virginia Beach. Um, that's uh, a harbor that's off the Chesapeake Bay uh, that leads both directly to this military installation but also to several industries that are located there on the water and also um, several neighborhoods that have uh, waterfront access uh, and that enjoy boating in and out of the bay there. Um, there was a proposal recently uh, from the Navy to actually require uh, boaters to radio in and request permission and announce their presence when they're coming and exiting in, and um, entering the, the harbor. And there was quite a lot of public pushback against this. Like, why would you, why would you want to do this? So the one is that the Navy just kind of like proposed this out of nowhere in some cases. And then also, the, you know, the, the, the citizenry, the people that live there that would have to actually deal with this situation um, had no idea where it was coming from. They didn't know that this was a conflict to begin with. And I think on, on the, from the Navy's perspective, they did not quite understand all of the, the ramifications of, of how um, this might actually impact the local community. Uh, so, for example, one specific example of that is that, um, you know, there are size requirements or minimum size requirements for having this kind of radio that they would be able to use. I believe it was 65 feet, or if you're less than 65 feet in length, you don't necessarily have to have the, the radio that they would be required to actually do this. So there would be boaters out there that aren't actually, ha don't have the equipment to even do what the Navy's trying to ask them to do. Um, they did back away from this proposal, but I do think this is an example right here of how communication and, and education between the installation and between the local community about what's going on at the base and what are the important, you know, things that be, need to be known about that installation's mission and how it might conflict with local priorities. Those conversations need, need, those conversations need to take place. Another example um, on the data side here, this is actually from a, a project that we're currently working on right now that I'll get into in a moment. But what I want to point out here is that we have some, um, this is an example of how water infrastructure and water management crosses uh, the fence line going from Virginia Beach into Expeditionary Base Little Creek and out of the base and then back into Virginia Beach. And the challenge here that I want to mention is that um, for many years, the city has been, uh, Virginia Beach has been working on a study to actually update its stormwater management plans. They've been doing a master drainage study, some sea level rise planning analysis work, very extensive undertaking in the millions of dollars to come up with very detailed plans for how they're going to improve their infrastructure to deal with flooding. When it comes to dealing with this area, though, uh, they need to know how water is moving around on the Navy installation. And uh, for several years, for about three years, the Navy refused to provide any data to the city on how that water was moving around, what sort of infrastructure was being used on the base to move that around. So the city was not able to actually incorporate that information into its planning uh, work. Um, they did uh, happily get that information. Uh, leave the, uh, well, it's March now, so back in January, just got the data. But still, three years of, of stonewalling and, and conflict between the city and the Navy about whether or not they can get data, of getting kind of um, mixed messages from the, from the installation. Um, that I think what shows is that this, this data this is, is really critical to effective local planning. And I think sometimes the, the, the military doesn't necessarily understand exactly how important in an area, an urbanized area like this, where the, the installation and the city are literally right next to each other, how important that is to have that data available for both sides to do effective planning. I'll say there's another example, uh, actually just further to the west, uh, for another situation on Amphibious Drive where there's some flooding that's taking place, cutting off uh, access between the two halves of the base. Um, and in that situation, there's a misunderstanding right now about what's causing that flooding. Uh, and that hasn't been addressed. Um, and I, the city thinks it's one thing, the Navy thinks it's another thing. Um, and there's been a lot of pushback from both sides about whether or not um, they can actually come to an agreement on it. Uh, from our perspective, I think, you know, what we would recommend and what we're trying to encourage them to do is to actually think about, like, doing some sort of study to really identify what those causes are so that everyone's on the same page, because right now they're not, and that's producing a conflict. Yes, when that, when that flooding happens, it cuts, cuts it in half. So this, and this is um, this example here that I have of, of Norfolk International Airport is an example of where the priorities and the missions of the the Navy 
in Hampton Roads and the desires and priorities and wants of a local community are having direct conflicts. So here, um, and also that there's some misunderstanding that has result that has really exacerbated the situation. So Norfolk International Airport has one main runway right now. They'd like to have another run runway. Um, that runway would be to the east. So you can kind of see what the path of runway here. Um, this is the Norfolk. This is, what is this going to go? Yeah, not really. Okay. So uh, Norfolk, that's the, the green blob on the right side there is, is uh, the uh, runway protection zones and noise zones around uh, Norfolk International Airport. The uh, longer axis is the main runway. They'd like to have a parallel runway put into place there uh, to uh, increase the capacity of the airport. Uh, unfortunately, um, right now the, uh, the airport is in a delicate position where it's already conflicting with the use of Little Creek, um, with the ships that come and enter the harbor, and with some of the um, things that are stored at that installation right now in terms of ordinance. Um, a parallel runway would uh, significantly increase those negative impacts to the base. Um, the unfortunate uh, thing about this from our perspective is that neither the installation nor the city have really talked about this issue for quite some time until very recently. Um, and part of that issue is that since 9-11, uh, Little Creek has actually uh, greatly increased the size, not only of its just general personnel size, but in terms of the, the missions that are going on there. Little Creek and Fort Story, it's, it's um, uh, sister installation over um, on the uh, corner of Virginia Beach, are some of the um, premier homes for the Special Operations Forces for the Navy, uh, some pretty unique training facilities uh, that are uh, mostly unavailable unless we're on the East Coast. And so in terms of importance to the Navy, these facilities are absolutely critical. The Navy really didn't communicate this to the cities for quite some time, and it's only really in the last couple of years when we've been having more um, extended conversations that, um, that these uh, issues have come up and that we've started to have these, um, you know, trying to think about ways that we might be able to resolve the situation. So that's for the bad stuff. Uh, on the, on the, the good side, well, we, do, we do see um, a number of opportunities here. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of coordination. I know we, we joke about having so many meetings, and as a planner and, you know, as working as a regional entity, we go to a lot of meetings, we host a lot of meetings, but having that coordination is absolutely critical um, to improving uh, relationships, to getting to the right answer more of the time, if not all of the time. On a planning side, um, working together, we can start, try to identify some of these conflicts ahead of time so that they don't become problems. And then from a funding perspective, uh, there are opportunities out there right now, and Ann mentioned a couple, um, that um, are available where we might be able to pool resources and result and uh, come up with some better outcomes. One of the, uh, the projects that we've been working on right now, and Ann, I think you, you knew I was going to get there, it just took me a while to get there. Uh, we have been working on a joint land use study with the Navy, with all the installations in Norfolk and Virginia Beach for the last two and a half years or so. And through this, we've been able to develop some criteria that we're using to evaluate uh, the benefits for military use or military oper operations and readiness of local infrastructure projects. We've looked at these different categories. Um, we scored them with our, our technical committee of local staff and Navy representatives to see which of these, these kind of capital improvement program projects might actually be, um, have a, a tangible benefit to the Navy installations. And we're using that to develop uh, a kind of prioritized list when it comes to looking for potential funding opportunities of saying this project is not only important to Norfolk or Virginia Beach, but it's also important to the Navy. Um, we also think that this is a model that could be used by other communities around the country. Um, so with, through this study, what we've identified, and, and Ann mentioned the, the accessing the base issue, um, we've looked at specifically on the resilience, pres resiliency perspective, how roadways and Hampton Roads that are important to the military, which is a study that we've already done um, several years ago, um, would be affected by flooding, and we've also looked at how um, access to community assets might also be affected by flooding. And these are both important, not only for directly accessing the installation and, and maintaining operational readiness, but also for uh, maintaining and improving quality of life of, of Navy of sailors and of, uh, servicemen and women and their dependents. Um, a lot of the conversation with the Department of Defense over the last several years has, been, has emphasized the importance of quality of life. Uh, to future DOD allocation of, of assets, of commands, of resources. And from our perspective, when we think about sea level rise and recurrent flooding, that that's a major impact of quality of life, not only of the, uh, sit our, our citizens, um, in our, our civilian citizens in Hampton Roads, but also of our, our Navy residents that are there, sometimes temporarily, and sometimes they choose to stay after they retire or they separate from the service. But being able to understand tangibly how uh, sea level rise and flooding are negatively impacting the quality of life of those individuals is a really big part of figuring out exactly what kind of projects should be undertaken if we're thinking about um, how a project that the city might undertake would actually benefit 
uh, the Navy. So in a couple um, opportunities, other opportunities beyond the joint land use study that we've been working on, uh, one is in flood risk management. Norfolk has just recently completed, or they're just about to complete and finalize, a coastal storm risk management study with the Corps of Engineers. Um, right now, unfortunately, there's a lack of authority uh, to work together with uh, military installations. There's very limited ability to actually go on base and say uh, that a specific um, construction project here on the base would actually benefit not only the civilian community but also the, the installation. Um, so there, it's difficult right now to coordinate military construction and, civ and civil works funding streams. And from our perspective, we think that needs to be corrected. Um, and then also uh, from another example where an opportunity exists, and this is kind of more of a, I guess, a, you know, a, a construction project type of thing, but from a shoreline management perspective, you can see from this diagram, you can kind of tell, uh, there's some yellow lines on there that are showing where our, our sandy beaches are in Hampton Roads. Norfolk, Little Creek, Virginia Beach, and Fort Story all share basically an unbroken sandy shoreline on the Chesapeake Bay. And unfortunately right now, because of the, the vagaries of funding um, and civil works authorizations and MILCON authorizations, uh, it's been very difficult to actually look at um, doing a, a strategic and comprehensive shoreline management approach um, that would provide beach nourishment and replenishment uh, for all of those at the same time, which would actually result in an overall better project that, was also, that would also be more cost effective. Um, so there are a lot, a lot of other things going on um, in Hampton Roads. I mean, I'm happy to you know, answer questions after we're all done here today. Um, but I will end on a few points. One is that um, communication is not always easy, but it is absolutely critical uh, to moving forward together, to working together as partners. And uh, just one note here is that public notice is not sufficient when it comes to communication. You know, we've heard from our cities and from the, the military that they put something out there for the public to see that that's good enough. It's absolutely not. Having those personal relationships, knowing who to call, at what level you need to call someone is, is absolutely critical to being able to, to understand one another and to work together um, in the future. Sometimes there are conflicts and sometimes they can't always be resolved, but at least if you actually have discussions that you can still maintain those relationships. And then there are real opportunities, and Ann mentioned a few of those, the Defense Access Roads Program, Defense Community Infrastructure Program, and then also the Core Civil Works Program as well, where we might be able to work together to actually develop projects and plans that would, would benefit both our communities and our installations in Hampton Roads. So thank you all for your time, and uh, looking forward to the discussion later on. Thanks so much, Ben. Well, and hopefully, uh, a lot of other communities around the country will be able to look at some of the work that, that you are doing in terms of, uh, so everybody doesn't have to reinvent the wheel as, as far as putting some of these things together. So our final uh, speaker on this panel, somebody who has been looking at these issues on uh, sort of across the board, on uh, sort of looking across in, in terms of thinking about all of DOD's facilities, what is this, what does this mean? What does this mean with regard to security overall? And so we are very, very pleased to have John Conger with us today, who is, John is the director uh, for the Center for Climate and Security, where he oversees all of the center's programs and chairs uh, the center's climate and security advisory group. And he's been with the center for a number of years, but he, also was the principal deputy undersecretary of defense or the comptroller uh, at DOD for, uh, for several years. And that, uh, that and his subsequent work have given him a very, very special eye to looking at the kinds of costs that are involved, the different entities that are involved and how these entities need to be in touch with each other, what are all of the places that you need to kind of uh, touch, which we've heard from Ben and from also uh, Admiral Phillips, uh, that how many people really are involved in terms of trying to figure out how best to address some of the problems that we are seeing in real time today. John? Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? <clears throat> So I know that it's Friday afternoon, and I know that, you know, for, for those of you who are staffers, your next step is going to be, you know, the early happy hour where you slip out of the office and everybody sort of takes a little bit of a break. Um, yes. So I'm going to do my best to, to send you out on a good note by uh, telling you some horror stories and, 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 and give you at least something to chat about. 
Um, I've got uh, three main points to leave you with. Three, I've, I've learned that when any, anybody gives a speech, if you say more than three things, really, when it all boils down to it, you're not going to remember anything I said anyway. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with three basic things that I want you to take away from here, but I'm not going to tell you them all up, up front. Um, uh, you're going to have to wait for that. Uh, so, and I'm going to add one little star, because Susan uh, brought up the, uh, the NSC panel. And I'm not going to uh, leave the podium without talking about that, but I'll save that to the end. Um, so first, the first thing you've got to know is that our bases are under threat. We are, do you, does anybody know the last base that was evacuated because of a climate emergency? I bet you don't. It was Point Magoo in California because the wildfires were coming. Now, wildfires is just one of those things uh, that, that we uh, don't always think of when we're thinking about climate change impacts. Wildfire season has gone from a season to all year long. Why? Because we have drought issues, we have climate changes in the... Is, are all wildfires caused by climate change? No, but it creates the conditions uh, that we're seeing today. Uh, are, are climate changes responsible for every hurricane? No, we've had hurricanes for a long time, but you can see changes happening. Increased intensity. Uh, you, you know, go down to Tyndall or Camp Lejeune and you ask them if they care about climate change. Um, for those of you who, who aren't tracking, Tyndall Air Force Base was pretty much leveled by uh, Hurricane Michael uh, just a few months ago. Um, her, uh, so Tyndall and Lejeune together, you're looking at close to $10 billion worth of repairs. That gets your attention up here. You know, it's not real money until you're talking about billions, billion here, billion there, and then you're talking about real money. That's the quote. Anyway, the point is our bases are under threat. You've got sea level rise and flooding, storm surge issues at, at bases like Norfolk and in the Hampton Roads area, which you've just heard about. They are very, very concerned. What, what are, why are they very, very concerned? It's because the roads flood. If, you're, if your uh, airfield is flooded, you can't fly planes out. It has operational issues. They've had to raise the piers, not because the piers were going to be underwater, but because the electronics under the piers was getting affected by the salt water, so they had to lift up uh, these structures in order to be able to service the ships. There are a whole host of problems, and, and Hampton Roads and Norfolk are at the front lines of this problem, in part because of the fact that the ground is sinking, like Ann, Ann mentioned, um, in part because we have so much military concentration in that one location. But you're focused there, and, you're, and you look at it, and that's what is going to happen in other locations over time. So be concerned. So our bases are under threat. And we should all be worried about this to a degree. Um, you know, you look at a place like Diego Garcia, important strategic location in the Indian Ocean. It's at three feet above sea level. At some point in the, in the decades to come, uh, that may be an issue and may impair imp operations, one would think. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, the Reagan test site at Kwajalein Island in the, or uh, Kwajalein Atoll in the, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, DOD came out with a study last year that says uh, that because of uh, wave action over the island, because of sea level rise, that the salt water is getting into the aquifer and within by as early as 2030, that island is not going to be able to support human habitation. There won't be drinking water. What are you going to do? You just spent a billion dollars on a radar there. What are you going to do? So, um, what you're going to do is you're probably going to either build a desal plant or just ship in water all the time because you just spent a billion dollars on a radar. But, okay. So, as we look at this problem, understand that there are infrastructure issues. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the other things that we can talk about with regard to climate security because we're here to talk about communities. And we're here to talk about infrastructure. So the second thing I want you to remember, so first thing, base is under threat. Remember that. Second, climate doesn't care about the fence line. So that means if your base is under threat, so is your defense community. And oh, just for a reminder, that's where all your voters live. Um, so as we contemplate the fact that your bases are under threat, and we, as we contemplate the fact that the climate doesn't care about fence line, that means that you need the same sort of resilience measures outside the fence line that you need inside the fence line. We just heard about a lot of those. As you, as you look at this big picture, the kinds of resilience programs, the climate resilience programs that DOD is thinking about today 
are the kinds of things that you're going to have to start thinking about in your civilian infrastructure. If you do an infrastructure bill, think about climate infrastructure and think about climate resilience because you're going to need a lot of investment in coastal communities, in places where, uh, you know, if you've got uh, fragile utilities that are going through wildfire uh, at risk regions, you're going to have to think about how to restructure those. There's a lot of investment that's going to have to be made. In, in Alaska, in Alaska, in Alaska, there, uh, the Air Force recently requested uh, funding in the FY19 bill because permafrost was thawing under Eielson Air Force Base, and the F-35, uh, one of the F-35 facilities there had the foundation crack and was no longer safe for people to be, to be inside, and they had to request money to replace the building in the FY19 bill. So things are happening today. This is not some future thing. This is happening today. So I'm going back to my reminders. One, bases are under threat. Two, climate doesn't care about fence line. Three. What is important, so I used to own all the infrastructure at DOD, like roughly a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure, and I was the landlord, okay? I had to pay attention to this on a daily basis. What is critical to remember is because, because those bases depend on those communities next to them. They are not islands. The local communities are indispensable to those bases. They can't, the base counts on the local community for often for electricity, for water, for wastewater, for stormwater uh, relief. What ha let's talk about wastewater for a second. I know, it's Friday afternoon. Waste what, what happens when you have a big storm and the toilets stop flushing on the base? Because down, you know, down lower, uh, you have a, wa a, a civilian wastewater facility that is no longer operational. This starts to cause a really serious problem on the base, even if the base thinks it's resilient. So water, wastewater, stormwater, electricity, housing. All of your civilian employees live off base. What happens when they can't get to the base? So transportation, there we go. Communications, what happens when your cell, cell towers all lose power? Civilian infrastructure, military family housing. Two thirds of it's off base. How focused is that military officer going to be on, on his or her job when their family doesn't have food, doesn't have power. This has an impact. This is important. Those communities are indispensable to the successful operation of those bases. Now Ben was talking about the need for everybody to talk together. I can tell you right now that they, the base and the community do talk together. But in the event of an emergency, do they know who to call? They might. But there's no structure in place to make sure that you do. We set up a couple pilots. Anne uh, was, was a significant part of one of the one, of the one in, in Norfolk. Ben might have been involved in it, too. Um, um, each of the military services did a pilot where the community and the base were supposed to talk together and try and figure out how to coordinate on things. Uh, the Air Force did one at uh, Mountain Home, and the Army did theirs with a bunch of natural, National Guard bases up in Michigan. And the whole point was to create a framework for people to be able to talk to each other. Who do I call? What do I call about? What are my, in, what are my dependencies outside the base? Uh, it's on a shelf somewhere. Uh, you know, it, the study got done, and uh, they haven't set up the framework that I had intended. But that's OK. These things happen. The, the, the point, though, is that, that, that those lines of communication, that kind of framework, that kind of in, th these guys are busy, right? Everybody's busy. But you've got to know what to do when something happens. And you've got to know who to call. That's critical. But if you can take away one thing from my conversation today, the bases are under threat, climate doesn't care about the fence line, it's that if the base is resilient and the community is not, the base is still screwed. Because they depend on that community for electricity, for water, for wastewater, for housing, for transportation, for communications. Resilient communities matter. They matter to the base. They matter to the national defense. So let's talk about the national defense for a second, and let's talk about the, uh, what's been in the news. I'll, I'll, uh, I, I hadn't planned to talk about this today, but 
You know, I'm, I, I am always reluctant to, to miss an opportunity uh, to give a few candid comments. Um, so, so apparently, there was an effort inside the National Security Council by a particular staffer to, uh, to rethink the Defense Department's a judgment on the threat of climate change. They wanted to set up a commission, a co presidential committee, to take an adversarial, in quotes, view of defense reports, of intelligence reports, and their conclusion that, that climate change is a threat to national security. They wanted to impose their judgment over folks like, you know, Secretary Mattis or General Dunford or any of the, uh, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 other senior leaders who have said, uh, made public statements on this or any of the military officers who have been working on uh, various, uh, you know, planning documents and, and trying to figure out what to do to make their bases more resilient. Nope, they were going to say, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. All of, the, all of these things you've heard about climate change, it's all fake. And so because of their personal agenda, they wanted to impose a blind spot and create a vulnerability because it was impairing their ability to make their case that the military stood up and said it was a risk. Now, I'm getting a little animated. It's Friday afternoon. Um, the bottom line here is, why would you want the military to be less ready? Why would you want them to be less resilient? That doesn't make any sense. The military is a contingency-based organization. They prepare for wars they hope they will never have to fight. I hope that there isn't some hurricane that hits a base this fall. I'm willing to bet there will be one. Shouldn't they be ready? Shouldn't they be resilient? Shouldn't the communities next to those bases be ready or resilient? They should be. You know, the guy who was trying to run that panel isn't a climatologist. He wanted to, to get in there and edit the science because he had an opinion. But, but all of the climatologists say this stuff is happening. It doesn't take a scientist to see the sea levels rising or the Arctic ice is melting, to see there's more drought, to see the glaciers are melting to see the stress that places on, around the world on different countries and to see the instability that happens. I, you know, I'm, I'm less likely to take uh, his word on that. And I mean, look, I'm not gonna add, just because you're a scientist doesn't mean you're an expert on everything. I'm not gonna take their medical advice either. I'm not gonna believe them if they tell me that cigarettes are good for me. It's, Anyway, sorry, I'm off topic. I apologize for you know, going on a rant. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you all are, are tired of listening to me talk. So anyway, I'm going to go back to my main, uh, main points. So uh, three things I want you to remember. One, our bases are under threat. Two, climate doesn't care about the fence line. And three, if the base is resilient but the community is not, the base is still screwed and we need to do something about that. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Thank you very much. bit of time for for questions and and obviously in terms of what John was talking about it's so important because we're dealing with real people um, real security questions real things that are happening on the ground today okay let's start here Richard Hoy Bethesda I live near the Joint Naval Facility Bethesda Walter Reed uh, thank you for your comments uh, congressman uh, I live in the community close by. Uh, there are, uh, if the community is not ready, then the base is not ready, is, uh, is a very important point. And uh, uh, to follow the money uh, to address the issue, our, uh, our uh, federal funding of localities through transportation funding and infrastructure funding goes, uh, goes to the states rather than to the metropolitan planning organizations like Hampton Roads or like the Washington Area uh, Council of Governments. Uh, 
so this interferes with the ability to plan and uh, prepare for infrastructure community-wide that mm -hmm. uh, would address the issues of that uh, region that houses the military bases. Um, so I'd like comments from uh, anyone on the panel uh, as to the issue of, of how we can direct funding uh, to incentivize uh, a resilience in the uh, communities to, to focus that conversation based upon decision making that is shared between the base and the, and the local community rather than go through a, a state agency far away and politically uh, removed. So I don't work on transportation, uh, but I do work next door to them. And uh, so one of the things that, that our organization, um, our sister agency, the Heroes Transportation Planning Organization has been doing um, is they've been trying to figure out exactly how to, to incorporate resiliency issues into their long-range transportation plan. So that's one of the, um, the documents that they're required to produce by Federal Highway every four years. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging issue, it's, you know, because, because that's a document that in some ways it really does direct um, how money, how federal highway funding will be spent in the region. Um, and when you think about whether or not we penalize a project because it might be vulnerable or whether we give them bonus points because it might be vulnerable and we need to protect that asset, um, that's, that's a question with no easy answer. And there, we don't have a consensus on exactly how to go about that just yet. Um, but they hope to have um, something with that figured out over the next year or so. I believe the next one is supposed to be done, what is, next year maybe, I think. So next couple of years, they're gonna be done with the next round of that planning process. Um, but I do think there is, there is an opportunity um, in the, the underlying regulations and the, the, the authorization, the statute that Congress passes for metropolitan planning organizations and the, the things that they're required to do by law and the funding that they get to do those tasks um, to incorporate resiliency um, if that's something that the Congress thinks is important. It just hasn't um, made its way into the requirements just yet. Um, but it is there as an opportunity. So perhaps that's also something that should be looked at in infrastructure bills before the Congress this year, right? And, and I wanted to ask you, since you are now, um, in, terms of the, in terms of the governor's office, uh, do you want to talk about the whole funding, how, how you're trying to look well, at it? Well, it's a similar um, challenge. I mean, we're just kind of one level up. And uh, by chance, uh, my seat at my office is actually in the middle of the Secretary of Transportation's spaces. Um, I think they think I'm a spy. So if they're watching, <laughs> I'm not a spy. But it does help to sit there because I can hear what they're talking about all the time. Um, <laughs> and they're talking about this. They're talking about resilience. They yeah. realize that they need to be... Uh, that this is an issue for them. Partic they're particularly interested in rainfall challenges and culvert sizing, and and uh, and I've been doing work on it uh, to prepare for what's coming, uh, and also to to start to think about how they want to deal with rising waters, because these these are major, major infrastructure. And as those of you who you know run up and down I-64, uh, Virginia. Uh, or paid any attention to the General Assembly this year, what, was, what were the big conversation items? I-81 funding to, to fix, and fix is a huge scope for I-81. What's it going to be? Um, Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, new tube in infrastructure, I-64. Uh, there are special funding districts set up to fund pieces of the highway mm -hmm. construction. HRTPO is one that looks at the Hampton Roads region. but. Um, Certainly there's an understanding that this is a problem and this is an impact or to these major construction projects that are expected to last, you know, into the next century. So mm -hmm. we're not, uh, it's, it's no small matter and it's no small amount of money. And, uh, but the challenge is when you start to look at the, the cost, depending on how you set your standard, that, that scares people away. Um, but the answer isn't don't hide it and run away. The answer is let's figure out what it's gonna cost to make ourselves resilient. Let's set those standards. Let's plan to those standards and understand what the costs are, and then figure out how we're going to how we're going to meet that challenge. And then make sure you don't that have the, any choice. That the comptroller at DOD is totally aware right. of what needs right. to be done in terms of that kind of coordination. John, you wanted to add? Oh no, I, I would say that the comptroller uh, will explain that DOD's budget is too small and they probably need more um, because it always does because there's not enough money to do everything. Uh, when I was in charge of installations, I could tell you that you know we, the DoD installations are roughly have a roughly uh, 100 billion dollar backlog in maintenance. 100 billion dollars of 
of backlog and maintenance. They are having some serious problems. And so when somebody says, can you fund this other stuff, they're probably going to be uh, a little bit gun shy. Uh, they will be, but the money has to be found. I mean, if you guys end up doing an infrastructure bill, I think this would be a good topic. And I'd, I'd like to make one more point since I now live in a statewide world and coastal protection statewide. It's not just the major industrial areas or the highly populated areas that are a problem. We have huge problems with road infrastructure in rural communities on the eastern shore and the middle peninsula. First incidents of sunny day flooding closing schools in Matthews County was in 2018. Won't be the last. Uh, we have towns on the eastern shore that are connected by one road that's practically at sea level. Saxis comes to mind if anybody's ever been there. Um, and so that's a small town at the, on the inner you know, bay side of the eastern shore. It's actually almost opposite Wallops Island, if you're kind of familiar with that infrastructure. It has its own fire department out there, thankfully, so it can take care of itself in that context. But what do we do with these communities? How do we make decisions? Because when we start to prioritize in Virginia, Virginia has a really interesting smart scale project prioritization process. The road to Saxis doesn't come out at the top of the list, but we still have a responsibility to people. So how are we going to start to make decisions over time over which, how are we going to deal with rural roads and, and how are we going to deal with rural roads long term? Um, because in many of these uh, rural communities, um, people need to know what their choices are. Mm -hmm. and, and we're still working through and, and in some cases just starting to work through how we're going to figure out what those choices are and how we're going to prioritize for them so they know how to prepare themselves and, uh, and what, the, what, what the future holds for them uh, as they prepare their community for what's coming. Well, and listening to you all the time, it's not our friend. Uh, question right here. Halsey Payne from Senator Keene's office from Maine. Uh, to switch gears a little bit, uh, first, thank you all for coming here. Uh, this is fantastic and it's, can't be more important. Uh, Rear Admiral Phillips, uh, to switch gears for a minute from the uh, adaptation side to the mitigation side, uh, are the bases in uh, this region doing more to uh, promote renewable energy efficiency energy use and emissions reduction, and is that a uh, base decision and a local decision or a national decision? So in the context of resilience, and we know we've been talking about encroachment as, as resilience or resilience in dealing with encroachment and climate impacts as being encroachment, in the context of resilience, uh, quite a bit of work has been done within the Department of Defense to give bases more independence, particularly in options for power generation as one significant issue. So in Hampton Roads, we have, a, they've had a number of opportunities. Um, large solar farm has gone in in a public-private partnership with Oce Naval Station, uh, NAS Oceana. <laughs> Naval Station Norfolk has rebuilt its power plant, made it cogeneration. Uh, some of it is fossil fuel, absolutely, but it can burn other kinds of fossil fuel now. It doesn't have to rely on one thing. Um, that's in progress. They are also a test platform for an innovative energy monitoring and consumption process so that they know, you know where they have um, extreme energy use and they have the option to, to reduce energy by turning off lights and that kind of thing remotely. This is all still in progress, but, but they are a test-based platform for that. Um, and recently, the Department of Defense has changed some of its requirements in the context of building construction. After 9-11, every building that was built had to be built to the highest force protection standard, including uh, force protection grade windows. And when NAV, Naval Facilities and Engineering Command would look at upgrading a building to improve its energy efficiency, one of the reasons they could never meet the cost-benefit analysis was they had to put in these you know, super force protection high-grade windows. Well, DOD has recently relaxed that standard for facilities that are inside the fence line and not of a critical infrastructure um, or national security need so that they don't have to put in these expensive, extremely expensive windows. And so that will give us more opportunities over time to uh, be, do more energy efficient upgrades to buildings so we can, I mean, and Norfolk has a great example because there are buildings there that are quite elderly. The base has been there, what was our 100th anniversary more than that? Um, recently, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the exact, I wanna say last year, but it might've been two years ago. Um, so number of buildings have been there, you know, almost that long. And, uh, and they could use an upgrade. So there's a great concern, because it saves money. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and by the same token, there's a great concern in saving fuel and, and, 
and being better consumers of fuel because it buys battle space. If I don't burn as much gas in my destroyer, I can stay on station longer. If I don't have to have a fuel convoy running fuel around in Iraq or Afghanistan or any other place we may find ourselves in the world, then I have less people at risk and I have more opportunities to stay on station and execute my mission. So there's a great interest in energy conservation and consumption. We are consumers of fossil fuel in the military. Yes, we are. Um, ships and airplanes and, and uh, not all ships, most ships and airplanes run on, on fossil fuel. But there's always an interest in saving money and building resilience and buying battle space. And uh, energy is a great way that the military can do and has and will continue to do that. So John probably knows more about that from his yeah. time. So, so I'll, I'll add a couple of thoughts. Um, there, there are a lot of projects on military bases where a developer will come in, say, I'll pay for everything up front. Uh, if you just give me some land on your base, and if, I, I, if you agree to buy the power back, we'll give you a rate that's lower than you're currently paying. So you pay nothing up front and you pay less uh, ongoing. It's usually a pretty good deal. Um, and, and so when you have a situation like that, it's hard to argue with the business case. Now, the DOD has moved towards more focus on resilience than business case. And so things are going to be more expensive if they require the developer to say, all right, well, if the power goes out on the grid, I need the power to come straight into the base, which is, you know, more expensive. Um, so as resilience increases in priority, and it's not a terrible priority, um, the business cases are generally harder to make. It's, it's, it's harder to make the case that this is free, basically. Um, but there's a bunch of different things that they do uh, within DOD to, to, to push that ball forward. Uh, Bottom line, though, is, is that they, you know, as Ann pointed out, DOD does have a lot of emissions. They do use a lot of energy. It's a big organization. You know, a lot of this is volume. Um, but there's a bunch of things that they can do. I think that it's fair to say in the last couple of years there's less top pressure to uh, achieve to pursue these projects. But it doesn't mean they're not doing them. It just means that there's less pressure to do them. Um, and, and so if they have a, a, the right opportunity, they're still going to take it. Okay, right back there. Hi, I'm Sarah Jensen with the Energy Department. Um, I'm very glad to hear the energy efficiency um, uh, measures are going forward in the non-critical buildings. Um, but I'm here to, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, municipal and regional coordination uh, issues. And I wanted to know if, um, what the, uh, if there's any leverage to be had from the Coastal Zone Management Act and Virginia's Coastal Management Plan, um, and whether that could be a source of um, structure for regular communications um, between bases and uh, local communities. Ben? Yeah, I think I can take that one. So um, the uh, Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program um, has actually been a, a critical source of funding for resilience planning in Virginia for a long time. Um, you know, I think I mentioned in my remarks that, that the state and the federal government hadn't really done a lot of work when we first started looking at these issues. The funding for that work came from the Coastal Program. Uh, I, it's, so in Virginia, it's, it's housed at DEQ. It's, it's sometimes kind of ignored because they don't, there's no state funding that goes to it. Like, I think it's one of the few states that doesn't contribute any additional state funding beyond the, the NOAA contribution. Um, and as a result, there's a little bit more independence um, from the Virginia program to actually pursue some things that, that may um, fly under the radar a little bit, and resiliency is one of those. Um, as, um, you know, in terms of the enforcement side and the Coastal Zone Management Act and um, the consistency determination process, um, I think that's probably what you're referring to. Um, you know, Virginia does not have any enforceable policies related to resiliency right now. Um, I think there is some interest on the part of um, the planning district commissions that are in the coastal zone and participate in that process um, to rethink some of our water quality and other uh, regulations that guide land use decisions um, on the in, in coastal areas to have more of a resilience focus. Um, and if that were the case, if we were to adopt, uh, you know, a revised um, uh, Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act or some other sort of state law that is also an, an enforceable policy into the program, that that would be a way for, um, you know, additional coordination with the military through that process. Um, the, unfortunately, I think that process um, it is very uh, Richmond-centric. So when the, the DOD or any other federal entity does an action in the coastal zone, the um, review of those projects, um, there's an opportunity for localities to participate 
but it's really coordinated through the state agencies in Richmond. And so the, a lot of, in my, my, um, my experience, uh, localities don't always take the opportunity they have to really participate in that process and uh, coordinate with the military. So I don't know if that would be the best model moving forward. I, I do think that the, um, the joint land use studies that we've been working on um, with our agency and also um, elsewhere in the region with some of the individual cities, that that is a go we're hoping to use that as a model to set up more um, regular coordination between all of the installations and all of the host communities that have um, that are hosting wh whatever installation it might be so that it wouldn't be just a, a typical uh, implementation committee that you might if you're familiar with the joint land use study process oftentimes there's an implementation committee that's set up after one of those studies is completed um, we think that there will be more issues down the road than the ones that we're just addressing right now and so having a more robust organization will actually be a, um, a better strategy overall for our region I don't know if that would apply to the rest of the state um, but when there are those opportunities to kind of look between what we're doing with the military and then also what we're doing with the coastal policy um, the uh, CZMP in Virginia that uh, we'll take advantage of it. I, I'm, so I sit on the coastal policy team in Virginia, so I participate in those processes I have for a number of years now. And um, so uh, I, I do see those linkages. Um, it's just that so far the opportunity hasn't really presented itself to actually uh, more directly connect the two. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. Okay, back over here. Hi, right, thank you all for coming. Uh, Chris Burke with uh, Congressman Bill Keating's office. Um, so um, we started with a little bit of a mention of the panel at the White House that may or may not be um, underway yet, but there were four committee chairs that responded with a letter. Um, and it kind of points to one of the things that would be helpful, I think, for folks to address here, you know, in, in Rayburn, um, that if, if four committee chairs are looking at it, it also can mean that, that four committee chairs think somebody else are going to do something about it. Um, and, you know, if everyone's responsible, then maybe it falls through the cracks and somebody thinks somebody else is going to pick up the issue. Uh, you know, the Langevin Amendment to the NDA a few years ago said prioritize the top ten facilities. Um, and maybe, maybe there's a prioritization or a, a place where we can start to get the most traction, which kind of, you know, it could be armed services, it could be, um, you know, all sorts of different places, the different committees, uh, House or Senate side, that can start to get traction on this that, you know, say, this is where we can start. This is the, the place that's both uh, the most severe situation or the place that we can do something about it um, most, most kind of directly and, and, and intelligibly. Um, to move forward, uh, that, like if there's like a thousand things we got to do, it might be that we do none of them. I'll, I'll go. All right, so um, thank you for your question. I think that it's fair to say that things have already been happening on climate and security on the Hill for the last couple of years. The Armed Services Committees have been doing quite a bit. The Langevin Amendment, Langevin Amendment was, was important. Um, that top 10 list that was due uh, didn't uh, actually get delivered, but that's okay. I mean, they, they, the report, had, well, I don't know if it's okay, but the report had some interesting things in there, um, and we'll see if they send the, the list that was required after all, at, you know, since it was in bill language and everything. Um, but even last year, there were a whole host of, of different authorities, of different requirements, of strategies being required by the, the defense authorization bill. So, so so stuff has happened already. What I think the opportunity here is, uh, you know, when you think about the breadth of the ability to uh, pay attention to this, if you have an infrastructure bill, climate resilience can easily be a part of that, and that covers inside or outside the base. In that, uh, uh, in last year's uh, defense authorization bill, they included a new program called the Defense Community Infrastructure Program that is all about uh, using DOD money to shore up key resilience pro problems outside the base. Uh, so having that funded would be a good thing. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that climate, climate security stretches well outside of this realm. The Foreign Affairs Committee should and could and should be talking about this. There are, uh, you look at India and Pakistan. 
where they have severe water stress. And that internal to the, each of their countries, the, the, the stress between the ur urban and rural areas uh, is significant. And what was the tool that uh, India used, uh, one of the tools that India used in, in the current uh, uh, escalation of tensions? They shut off the water because it is, because uh, they're in drought, because there are, there are water scarcity issues. So this is certainly something that the Foreign Affairs Committees could and should be looking at. Um, but so, so because you have lots of committees, lots of committees can do different pieces of this problem. If you're going to look at the resilience of bases, sure, that's armed services and appropriations, right? Um, but if you're going to look at you know, instability around the world, that's the Foreign Affairs Committee. If you're going to look at uh, resilience in, in other civilian communities or even these civilian communities, you could have transportation and infrastructure. You could look at em energy and commerce. People ha can t take on, they don't all have to take on the whole problem. They can take on their piece of it. But just saying. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that's really interesting about infrastructure, uh, and I know that you know, I've heard from many, many people that that's a priority for the Congress. But if you think about the committees of jurisdiction, they actually just about all have a piece of infrastructure to deal with. And John's point, I think, is so well taken that we really need to understand you know, what falls within all of these different committees that everybody does end up with, with responsibilities. And we will do that one last question right back there. Hi there, Oliver Curtis with uh, Flame Mapper. We're a California-based predictive analytics company that works on uh, wildfire mitigation. Um, I just a lot of the points have been raised today. I thought uh, were really interesting, specifically the the dynamics between communities and bases, but also that there's some of these risks have very different exposure profiles and opportunities for intervention. As my question is really specifically because wildfire is so spatially diverse relative to with thousands and thousands of events per year, and uh, that mitigation can have an immediate impact on these sort of things versus other types of hazards. So I was wondering if, the, if you guys view wildfire differently from other types of events, uh, and or if there's any provisions in place that can kind of help with the, the uh, immediacy of certain types of issues versus others, other hazards. All right, so I'll, I'll take a whack at that, not to monopolize the microphone or anything, but I do love a microphone. Um, the, the, I, think, I think when we, DOD looks at the wildfire problem, I think, it, I, think I have to put it this way. Um, every base has a different problem, and so that is why we, we've sort of exhausted the, the value of enterprise uh, looks and enterprise solutions, and now they really need to be, as Ann pointed out, uh, looking at base-specific planning from now on. And, and so in and California, they're going to be looking at wildfire risk. And in Norfolk, they're going to be looking at sea level rise. And that's okay. They don't all have to have like a cookie cutter approach to this. They should all be looking at their own problems. Great. Thank, thank you. And I want to thank our wonderful panel. I hope you've all learned a lot this afternoon. I also want to thank you all for coming. And just to remind you that next week on Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're holding a briefing on a related topic, green infrastructure, a blueprint for climate resilient communities. And then on Tuesday, also at 2 o'clock, we'll be holding another briefing on electrification options for consumers and the environment, where, where we will be looking specifically at electrification where it makes sense from an environmental and affordability and access point of view. So I hope that you will join us. and I. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel.